Okay. Let's start. Huh? Yes, sir. So, so first of all, because of your because of your expertise in public governance, I wanted to ask you that you know, in the present times, considering we have this pandemic going on, how do you think public governance shall be? You know, adapt, how should it adapt to the present climate? And even in the aftermath of COVID, what changes do you think would come in the sphere of public governance? You see, uh, I think it's first of all important to understand that pandemic is something which is global in nature. Then you have epidemics which are regional in nature and you have endemics which are totally local. So the public system has to respond to all these three challenges uh, on, a, on a different platform, for example. Uh, let's start with endemics, for example. Endemics are those which are local and therefore it's possible for districts or maybe two districts or a district and a state government to look at an endemic issue. Uh, as far as uh, as far as epidemics are concerned, again, it is three or four states, and once one central government can perhaps handle it. As far as pandemic is concerned, and therefore, the biggest challenge is that you have to align the responses of uh, districts and states, districts in terms of endemics, districts and states in terms of epidemics. But when it comes to pandemic, this means that what the health department of the government of India is saying has to be in coherence with what the WHO is thinking, has to be in coherence with the other SARC countries, has to be in coherence with what everybody else is thinking because you, you cannot stop international movement of people, right? So certain protocols will have to be evolved and the evolution of these protocols cannot be based on arbitrary likes and dislikes. It cannot be based on the fact that I like you, therefore I'll have this norm. I don't like you, therefore I'll have this norm. We can't say that a person coming from Denmark will have a different set of norms than a person coming from Zimbabwe uh, or a person coming from New Zealand or a person coming from anywhere. So what happens therefore is that public systems in a pandemic mean that the all public systems all over the world have to respond to the international protocol that is in place. And it also means that as we find in our country that you have to find a national and a regional and a local adaptation. We live in Chandigarh, for example, and if there is a if there is a locality in Chandigarh, it's got so many sectors, it's got so many places. But if, if one particular area gets into a containment zone, now it is that the norms for a containment zone should be common to Coimbatore and Chandigarh and uh, you know wherever, wherever, wherever in the country. So it can't be that a district magistrate or a district civil surgeon can say no. I will have a different norm for, for Chandigarh, I'll have a different. So what public systems do in the case of a large pandemic is that the protocols get prescribed and therefore it leads to a lot of clarity and it cuts out discretion. For example, in Uttarakhand, if you or your father were to come, even if I know you very well, I will have to put you in quarantine because that is the norm of Uttarakhand. So this is all achieved by a very large public system. Which brings us to a much larger question on what is a public system. A public system is one which is governed by rules and which is governed by, by what is universally accepted rather than the, the, the whims and fancies of a particular administrator or a particular prime minister or a particular minister or, you know, in that sense. So I hope I'm clear, I've been able to clarify what should be the role of public uh, administrators in uh, pandemics or in epidemics or in anything, the, the role of a public administrator is to set norms in place. Yes. So following up to that question, like you talked about in while dealing pandemics, we have to, you know, different countries have to cooperate with each other. Like the pandemic transcends national boundaries. So keeping that in mind, what role do you think India's present foreign policy has while thinking about the pandemic that you know, we're encountering and how can that be used to our benefit and where do you think maybe we may face certain challenges in this regard? Uh, thank you for this question. And I must say that India's foreign policy is A++ at the moment because the one international organization which is at the center of COVID, which is at the center of combating COVID is the World Health Organization. And as you, as we are all aware, Dr. Harshwardhan, is now in the top leadership position there. And when he is in the top leadership position at the time of crisis, 
uh, and it's a major transition. So you know the, the, the global body which is going to determine the terms, the norms, the protocols, the processes, the procedures, and more importantly, these preventive steps that have to be taken for the next such problem. That is now being, that, that's now, you know, has an Indian brain. It has the, it has the, the brain of India there. Uh, and it's a major transition that is happening. Now, the point to note is that this pandemic has shown that health is actually the fulcrum of everything that we do. Therefore, amongst the global bodies of the world, the one which deals with health is certainly, I, I, it's not nice to use the word like control. It, it, is, it is where we can, where our thoughts will be heard and our thoughts will be given a legitimate hearing. Look, what will happen is that all countries, all institutions will have different perceptions. It is not important that my perception will 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 get the or, or my perception will, will will be better than anybody else's perception. What is important is that every perception must be heard, and every perception must get a legitimate uh, hearing. So, in that extent, WHO is certainly the best. If you notice that the G7 and the G20, uh, both of them are India now has a very important role in the restructuring of the new global economic order. That's going to be the order of the day. India again will have a very, very important role, both as a very important producer, as a very important consumer, as a, as a country, which will provide the IT services, the artificial intelligence, and all the new, I mean, the, the way to handle this pandemic, the way to handle this pandemic will be determined by India, and that is what will make India so strong. Now, on the 21st, we will have the World Yoga Day, where again you will find that India's soft power is getting projected. What is also very important is that India's traditional systems of dealing with, uh, with, with, with large with, with issues like COVID, they are also coming to the fore. But on the foreign policy front, you see foreign policy is basically an extension of your domestic uh, power. It's a function of your domestic. I mean, without meaning to, to sound dismissive about countries which are small, I mean, how will it matter if a country which is 150th in size and 148th in terms of population, even if they come out with a grand foreign policy, it doesn't matter. Foreign policy is actually a question of how much authority, how much ability, how much, how much can you influence the world around you. And there I must say that you know, this time, and I think we have to compliment the Prime Minister and the External Affairs Ministry, we reached out to everybody during SARC, uh, during this uh, during this crisis, our Prime Minister took the phone himself and talked to all the SARC leaders because he realized that it's not, I mean, you can't stop COVID from coming from Bangladesh, you can't stop it from, you know, entering from Bhutan or Nepal or whatever. So it is this reaching out, uh, the willingness to reach out, the willingness to learn, the willingness to communicate. I think in all these marks, Indian foreign policy uh, has been A++ during the times of COVID and, and, and even beyond the times of COVID, uh, because, see, it's only countries which have uh, technology, which have IT, which have soft power, which will be able to influence uh, the way the world thinks. And the way the world thinks is how the world, how the world will act, because it's first, the, the thought must come to your mind, right? Then only you will start uh, acting. Yeah, so like uh, in your answer, you know, you talked about a new international economic order being created. So, you know, be it Karl Marx, be it Adam Smith, everyone talked about workers like the proletariat as an essential part of an economic order. So presently, you know, in India, we have seen that the situation of migrant laborers has been, you know, very poor and it's very difficult and very distressing to see how uh, the problems that they faced. So how do you think that in the present, you know, situation, what can the government do better or what, what is the best we can do for the people of this country in that regard? Uh, thank you for asking this question and I, I, I first of all, uh, I must uh, say that you are a very sensitive human being and uh, I'm glad that you raised this question. Uh, now, there are two or three ways uh, in which we have to look at these issues. One is that uh, there is a crisis of livelihoods. There is an economic slowdown and we have to address that economic slowdown. I will focus more on what the state governments have done so far or what the policies are in place to do it. As you are aware, 
even before the orders of the Honorable Supreme Court regarding uh, the mapping of uh, their skills, mapping of their resources, and the Supreme Court's instructions on providing safe transport to everybody. Uh, you know, in fact, the Supreme Court said that within 15 days, they have to be sent to their, uh, to their homes, if they so desire. You don't have to push anybody to their hometowns. So the first thing to notice is that it, this was a crisis of a magnitude which nobody, nobody, nobody could have imagined. And it is for the first time that because of this crisis, we also realize how much of internal movement of labor there is in the country. Which also brings me to the point that when there is labor mobility, then this means that there is a there is an economic opportunity that is happening in various parts of the country and that people are free to go and access that economic opportunity. Now, it is in the background of these things, it is in the background of these things that people understand that when the sudden crisis happened, some of the steps which the government was in the process of taking and had yet not happened, like, for example, whether your ration card will have an all India application, whether your Aadhaar, Aadhaar card, of course, is all India, but the basic issue that had happened was on food entitlements, on, you know, whether your, because what is typically happening is that, uh, that, you know, let's say that there's a person, let's say Ram Bihari Singh from, uh, from, uh, from Ara, and he's working in, in say, Kaputla or Malot in Punjab. Now, at the moment, I mean, till COVID happened, we were not being able to transfer his food entitlements across the country. Now, imagine a theoretical situation where your food entitlements, which are actually, as you are aware, very, very reasonable, there is a right to food in the country. And that right to food in the country was very good and actually works uh, where your card is there. But this COVID has shown us that we've got to move one step further and we've got to ensure that this card operates throughout the country. Now, if this card was to operate throughout the country, uh, a lot of this movement may not have taken place. A lot of this movement took place also because there were certain administrative uh, things that were not completed before. So this has given us an idea on how it has to be done. Look, certainly there were difficulties of coordination in the first few days when this interstate movement of people started. But I must tell you that uh, given the scale of operation, given the scale of people who had to move around, we've been able to move about three to four crore people. I mean, that's 30 to 40 million people. It's, it's the population of, half the, of more, than, more than half the countries of the world will not have the population that we've been able to move around. There has been, there has been agony, there has been distress, but one also has to look at this in terms of, in terms of the scale of the operation. And yes, you know, it's very easy for people to point out that yes, one train you started from Lucknow and you had to go to Kerala and you ended up somewhere else. Look, these are problems which happen. And it is not that one should not acknowledge our problem, but one should not focus only on the problems and not see what has been accomplished. And I think that's a mindset and a mentality that your generation must take. Your generation must start first looking at the good and then balancing it with what is not good. Unlike our generation, which always starts with this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. And I think this has been the problem of our country. And I think you must address it. Your generation must address it. We have to be positive and we have to be looking ahead uh, and learning from our mistakes, acknowledging our mistakes, but not focusing on this mistake. When you get your result card, and let's say that you've got a 94, 95, 96, are you focusing on those, uh, are, you, are you focusing on your success? Or are you continuing to trip about the two marks, or the three marks, the four marks that you left behind? So let's change our, change the way we look at things. Right? Like, you know, our, we should have a certain amount of dissent, but we have to balance it out properly. Otherwise, the quality of your even your dissent disappears if you if you don't have anything else to you know praise and ultimately achieve for so that's something that seriously can be taken into regard so there was one more thing that you know this was like a complication that i was facing that like when the lockdown took place everyone was asked to first of all make an individual sacrifice and the like you know as a student of sociology it comes into play that you know to what extent does an individual have to sacrifice for the society, in this case being the country. 
so according to you how can a balance be maintained between you know national interest and individual sacrifices so although it's very important for humans you know for everyone to stay in the lockdown and all but how to maintain that proper balance in different situations so that there can be a proper balance of national interest and individual sacrifices see uh, uh, you asked uh, the question which is very very pertinent look there are things in your control and there are things which are not in your control obviously what is not in your control you cannot do you can only do things which are in your control. and of the things which are in your control what is it that is best for you and what is it that is best for the nation in about 80 to 90% of the cases there will be no conflict i mean for instance if 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 the if you are asked to do yoga on the on the national yoga day i mean something you are i mean it's good for you it's good for the nation if you follow the rules it's good for you it's good for the nation we have to find out with the honeycomb which are those things which are good for you and not good for the nation i mean can you can you think of some immediate examples i mean everything that is you know the way we make the hierarchy of 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 uh, of ethics says that your good and my good cannot be in contradiction you see that is how a good society runs if my good is at the expense of somebody else's good then obviously it is not a well thought out proposition or a, not a well thought out uh, you know uh, proposition see what is the nation the nation or the ideals of the nation are what are enshrined in the constitution right the constitution very importantly talks about three things and you know those three things right liberty equality and fraternity now whatever helps whatever helps in the quest for equality and the quest for fraternity must be strengthened must be now there could be issues where some philosophical thought is hitting out at the element of fraternity right because there could be ideologies there could be philosophies which are which are preventing you from being fraternal to each other right now there i think in my opinion being government servant and having you know served the government for 35 years which it's second nature for me to always reflect back on the constitution let me put it like this that as far as the constitution is concerned anything anything any thought which promotes liberty must be studied must be studied in further detail and must be disseminated any thought any school of philosophy which supports equality and equality is not just equality of mates equality of men and women it's not just equality it is also equity go ahead read it I'll be delighted and next of all is fraternal so anything which is preventing us from being fraternal to each other if anybody is teaching us that look this particular thing is uh, that that so and so is not equal and so and so is not good then that is something to be said because as long as our constitution says that the essence is liberty equality and fraternity i don't see there any any contradiction for a young indian uh, to 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 you know to be to read this or to read that and i think all these are also artificial categories uh, yes sir it's true you know the sole thing that you know, because the way and again it is not just what the left say it is it is how it has been practiced how it has been practiced in the ussr i mean now do you call china a communist country not at all it com- it combines totalitarian Totalitarianism and all. Things that you know. In fact, I, our generation was also brought up to believe that that because you label something, you know, so you have to go beyond the label, go beyond the label, and read everything. You must read everything, and you must critically analyze everything, and you must then ask yourself if this is what the Communist Manifesto says: dictatorship of the proletariat. It does not talk about the dictatorship of the party. but where is the strength of the proletariat in china who has got more power in china does the proletariat have more power does the people's liberation army have more power or does the communist party of china have more power think about this you'll get your answers and like you know your earlier point about uh, you know the constitution it really makes sense and the mantle also lies upon us you know preserving the sanctity of the constitution is a very important thing and you know that is something that we need to continue for a long while because the moral fabric of the country is also uh 
combined is you know proper and we are together just because of the constitution and preserving it is indeed a very important thing i think the way you have done your mun and uh, the way you've been able to get people from across like let's take it like this you think i would have i, I wouldn't have come to chandigarh to address your mun and you know not have been possible for me uh, but now we are talking and we in fact been able to connect to a lot of people so i think that this 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 uh, whole concept of uh, webinars the whole concept of getting together over uh, these calls is also very good in fact uh, not a day has passed uh, since the last uh, few days as so very good my it uh, help uh, I'm, I'm my it uh, technology person will tell me when i have not had a and it's been so great and i have addressed uh, uh, the librarians across the world on libraries post covid that was hosted by the andhra pradesh library association can you imagine now andhra pradesh library association um, and you know talking to the trophy academy we talked about this we will talk to a security seminar there so i think uh, uh, you know we have got to balance and understand that there is an opportunity in everything and we have to seize that opportunity car team seize the moment So, uh, plus, I really thank you, you know, for taking out some of your time to address the audience. We have like people from eight countries apart from India who are also participating in this event, and with a total of three hundred people and the organizing committee, we really like wanted to, you know, generate a culture of discussion and thinking more. Like because the biggest problem is when people, you know, trap themselves into invisible prisons, like an inability to think beyond a particular. horizon is what i guess a problem that you know we have to encounter so for that we have like 10 different committees to that we are doing this year ranging from you know historic committees like the bangladesh war that happened like the security council simulation of the bangladesh war then something like indian ocean dream association where we are talking about you know maritime security in the western indian ocean and indian committee we have it's very pertinent to uh, today's time the joint parliamentary committee on privacy affairs so this time we like try to introduce different committees and you know inculcate more ideas let people think more and this was you know talking to you was a part of it because we wanted a certain kind of discussion with you so that you could you know further enlighten the people who will be attending this conference so i really thank you for taking some thank you your time very out. much it's been a pleasure from my side also and uh, do come uh, do convey my regards to your committee thank you yes sir thank you sir thanks a lot